Good evening. Uh, my name is Alice Brown, and I'm the Chief of Planning and Policy at Boston Harbor now. But I'm here with you this evening because part of my job involves working very closely with the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk, who give regular tours, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And because I also get to work with Magdalena and her role at Harbor Keepers. Um, before we go any further, I'm going to turn it over to Liz to talk to you a little bit about the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk. I think you all know how to use Zoom and webinar, et cetera. But um, just in case, you can scroll your mouse over your screen and a few different options will pop up. One of them is chat and one of them is Q&A. Feel free to put questions in the Q&A throughout the evening, or you can write to us in the chat if you prefer. Q&A helps us keep things organized so we know which questions we've answered. Um, and if you are on a tablet or a smartphone, there's you click on your screen, you'll see a little three dot sequence. And when you click on the three dots, that's where you'll see the Q&A in the chat. So feel free to send us messages with questions. We'll reserve time at the end to go through all of those. And with that, I'll turn it over to Liz. Thank you, Alice, and uh, welcome to Magdalena. Um, I'm a volunteer with Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk, and we have um, three main parts of our mission. Um, essentially, we just really um, work to promote the Harbor Walk and to increase everybody's knowledge of it. Uh, but we do it in three ways. Uh, one is for years, we did monthly tours of different segments of the Harbor Walk. We pivoted to doing webinars, and we're delighted that Magdalena is doing hers today. Um, we hope to be returning to some tours within the next few months um, with smaller groups than typical, um, masked and all those good things. But um, it'll probably be a hybrid of um, some webinars and some in-person tours. The other thing is that we facilitate uh, cleanups along um, the waterfront. Some of them have been in partnership with the Harbor Keepers. Um, and finally, uh, we have a multi-year initiative of adding interpretive signs around the Harbor Walk. And at this point, 18 signs for which our group created the content are up in four different neighborhoods. And by the end of the summer, we anticipate that there will be 30. So we're very excited about that. Um, so with that, I'll stop so that Magdalena has time to share with us um, the vision for Chelsea Creek. Thank you, Liz. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Alice and Liz. Um, I'm excited to show this project to you all. I think um, you might have heard about it or maybe you've had a chance to learn about it or participate in the meetings, but uh, we have a final report with a lot of fun and juicy information that I think you'll find interesting. Um, so I will start sharing. Uh, is that okay, Alice? I can go ahead and start sharing. Yeah, great. Um, I will share my screen. Can you all see that? Looks perfect. Okay, great. So the name of the project, as Liz and Al said, it's called Vision Chelsea Creek. And essentially it was, um, it, it arised out of a public private partnership. Um, hold on there. Okay. So essentially, you know, we developed this uh, framework plan and the goal was to build a more accessible and resilient uh, waterfront, but to start with a vision along this industrial shoreline. Actually, this slide is not supposed to be here because it's supposed to be at the end. Um, but essentially, what is Vision Chelsea Creek? It's a six, it was a six month long visioning, planning, and stakeholder engagement process. And the goal was really to reimagine this whole shoreline area where there is an abandoned railway site, um, basically sandwiched between the oil tanks along uh, the Chelsea Creek in East Boston. Um, and again, the project really hoped to come up with a vision collaboratively to create a more equitable, accessible, and resilient waterfront along that whole stretch. Um, you know, clearly a lot of you already know this, and, and in particular, you know, being part of this group that works really hard to create awareness about, you know, the Harbor Walk is, you know, there's some areas still that are undeveloped that are just, you know, degraded, um, that need, you know, ecological restoration, that need recognition. Um, that need open space. Um, obviously, some of the communities along these areas, you know, you know, are environmental justice communities. Um, and essentially, we developed this vision through a private-public partnership, as I mentioned. It was funded by Cargo Ventures, um, but it was wholly led by the Harbor Keepers, uh, together with our partners, Scape Studio. Um, and I'm going to show you the project site, so we can just skip over the slide. Again, it was six months. 
Um, and we did a detailed technical analysis and we did a very thorough community and stakeholder engagement process. Um, the project team was us as the client. Uh, the steering committee consisted of the Boston Society of Architecture and the Boston Society of Landscape Architects um, with UTIL who worked on the transportation analysis and then they subcontracted Durant and Anastas who really looked at the regulatory framework along that whole stretch. Um, the study area is, you can see in the circle right there. Um, and the reason why we show this sort of zoom out to understand sort of within context where in East Boston is this located, you know, in relation to the region. Um, this was the actual project site. You can see right here in this rectangle. Um, and again, just sort of zooming in a little bit more, Chelsea across the creek. Up north, you have Revere. Down below, you have the airport. To the right, you have the broad sound, and you can see the Bell and Marsh, and obviously, you know, the inner confluence and flowing out into the harbor. Um, and this is the actual project site within this rectangle right here. What we were looking at is this red strip of land, which is public land owned by the Mass DOT and MBTA, and it is an old railway freight corridor that is now considered surplus land by the Mass DOT and MBTA. Um, so it's basically extra surplus land that they have that they haven't done anything with and it's, it's essentially abandoned and unfortunately very degraded. Um, but this was our study area right here along this pink line where the railway still is there. Obviously it's all degraded, but um, so I just wanted to make the distinction that it, it isn't where the cargo property is. It, there is a boundary line and we were studying the public. We actually did a visioning uh, project along the public part of the site. We didn't work on the private uh, adjacent site. Um, the project area, and here again, you can see it. So if you zoom out facing south, uh, you can see up at the top, that's where the airport is. Where I'm pointing my cursor here along the Chelsea Creek, where you see that bump out. So right along the site right there. Um, and this is just, again, in relation to uh, some of the other areas. You have Orient Heights, you have Suffolk Downs. Um, further up, obviously, is Jeffries Point. To the right is more Eagle Hill neighborhood. The, the, the abutting neighborhood is Harbor View and also Orient Heights and obviously the Chelsea Creek. And then to the right is Chelsea. And one of the things that we really, you know, wanted to make sure that we did thoroughly was really try to understand the site in relation to what was happening today, not just what happened in history, but really sort of you know, what's happening now and how that's gonna affect any development in the future of, of the site. Um, and as you can see here in the legend, you, know, you can see obviously you know, um, the, the projects that are being built along, you know, adjacent to the site or, or close to the site. Obviously, Suffolk Downs is probably the biggest one. It's a huge development project on hundreds of acres of land, uh, partially in East Boston or Revere, and it's really going to affect the whole area. It's a 20 year, you know, build up project um, that's very complicated. Um, and it's really adjacent to our study area right here. Then you have the Orient Heights Public Housing Development Project um, that is being redeveloped. Um, you have a couple of smaller development projects along Route 1A, um, you know, proposed bike lanes. Um, the, the Condor Street Urban Wild is farther down beyond the jet fuel tanks and so forth and so on. You can see the Greenway up, up, up over here close to the airport. Um, we're gonna talk more about the uh, East Boston uh, Greenway the, the East Boston loop that they want to create. Um, and then obviously one of the most important things that we needed to really understand was the Climate Ready Boston phase two, which was obviously just launched uh, a couple months ago at this point, or maybe a month and a half, which is really phase two of Climate Ready Boston for East Boston was to do a more in-depth analysis of, of the flooding and climate impacts in Orient Heights in particular. So we really need to, we needed to align you know, our vision and try to understand how to incorporate any existing analysis and ongoing projects that the city and the state was doing. Um, you know, we needed to really understand the regulatory overlay to see how the land use uh, in the past, how the land was used in the past, what it's being used for now, not just the project site, but really around the area, you know, how is the land being used? What are some of the factors to consider? And then, you know, and, and to consider that into the visioning so that we weren't setting ourselves up for a nice sort of, you know, kind of 
uh, aspirational vision, but something that could be implementable and that could be, you know, sort of a compromise, right? Because we want to make this happen. So it was really important for us to understand, you know, what, what are the limitations within the regulations, whether it's chapter 91, and you can see here um, the, the, in yellow, it's highlighted. Where it's highlighted is obviously the designated port area. So the whole site is within the DPA, subject to chapter 91 regulations within that jurisdiction. Um, you know, you, we have you know, some of the, the you know, um, what used to be Sales Creek, and obviously this whole area used to be Crooked Creek. So a lot of considerations with hydrology, understanding the flooding impacts, understanding you know, what was happening with, the, you know, what was the water doing during certain storm events and flooding. Um, and obviously, you know, the, in relation to the airport and the buffers. Um, and this is just some, some, you know, good images that were taken by Handel Architects, who was not part of the project, but they had done their own study. Um, and you can see sort of facing south, you can see Boston out in the distance with the MWRA pumping station. It's, it's an old pumping station that was obviously decommissioned, I think, in the 70s. Um, and you can see sort of along, you know, the shoreline area where the riprap is, is where the site begins. And then it goes up further north. And here you can see, again, sort of a, a bird's eye view looking down from the, the Orient Heights. Or maybe this was a drone. I don't think this was directly from the Orient Heights drone then, but looking down sort of towards southwest you can see the Chelsea Street Bridge and again here's the shoreline area a low tide and the railway corridor corridor starts kind of comes in you know where you see the vegetation it goes all the way up north and I'll show you another picture and here is um, an image looking north you can see right here is a Chelsea Creek the Chelsea Street Bridge to the left and this is the unused portion of the Martin Coughlin Bypass Road that is currently unused um, the jet fuel tanks to the left, Route 1A to the right. And again, where you see that vegetation, a little farther closer to the shoreline is where the railway corridor exists. It still exists. Um, obviously, it's degraded, um, not functional, but it's still there. Um, here you can see facing south at low tide where the bump out starts. Um, you can see the sort of natural, um, well, I mean, at this point, it, it's the natural shoreline areas where you can start to see some of the mud flats. Um, so these are natural formations of this whole area and it's very untouched essentially. Um, you have overgrown vegetation, you have a, underneath the vegetation is a railway, um, that old uh, ra rail, railway track that goes up north. To the left is a cargo property and to the right obviously is Chelsea. Um, this is facing north. Again, to the left is Chelsea Creek and to the right would be the cargo property. And here you can see the remnants of the railway tracks, which I think are fascinating. Um, and I'm gonna show you another slide of you know, the history of the railway. And again, this is facing north and this is the portion where it's really not, I, you know, I've done a site, I've done many site visits, walked the whole area many times, but this is a part where we really can't get into because it, it's um, too much vegetation. It's just not a safe area to walk in. Uh, but again, what were the project goals? You know, was really to come up with a vision that would create an inclusive and accessible waterfront for all. We want to make sure that we want to balance industrial and community lead needs along the waterfront. Um, we wanted to take the opportunity to really try and figure out where we can do some ecological restoration. Um, obviously, you know, promote environmental justice for all. And really where we create, you know, we can create access to the waterfront um, and open spaces, sort of a pathway, whether it's a greenway or whatever it may be, you know, to really foster more social resilience. Um, especially for the for the three neighborhoods that are close to the site. Again, you know, our our process was through a very collaborative, um, you know, process. Intentionally, we wanted to make sure that all stakeholders were able to contribute feedback, um, and that we really heard everyone's voice. We did everything in English and Spanish. Um, this is sort of a timeline of how we, we did the vision. We started with. Um, Essentially, you know, we did a lot of stakeholder engagement at the beginning with focus groups, stakeholder meetings, we did site visits, we did an existing conditions analysis, we did online engagement, we did a guided kayak tour that Alice attended, um, we did a series of workshops, um, and we did some, uh, you know, focused Latinx engagement as well, um, until, and then we kind of, you know, put everything together and, you know, devised a framework plan 
And that was the end of phase two. And now we are looking at doing, I'm sorry, phase one, and we're looking at doing phase two. But we wanted to make sure that that community feedback didn't sort of sit on the shelf. So we put it into project website. Um, we have an interactive website that is still up and everyone can, you know, sort of read through and interact as well. You can provide your feedback still to this day. Um, so we incorporated all that feedback, make sure that everything that was said was captured. Um, it was part of incorporated into this vision. Um, and it's just sort of some of the ways that we did engagement. Um, you know, it was very strategic, the way we thought about how to do it. Obviously during COVID, it was challenging, but it turned out to be great actually, because the digital format uh, was very conducive for people participating. So we did, um, we did some in-person outreach, uh, but we did a lot of email, you know, email newsletters, social media, we did the workshops, again, English and Spanish. Um, we had a good attendance for all the workshops. Um, and we really tried to reach sort of a diverse set of stakeholders. Um, we have a website uh, that Escape Studio put together by a uh, platform called Social Pinpoint. It's still up. Anybody's welcome to go and look at all the documents, listen to the recordings, and really add your feedback. Again, that's still live. Um, this is just a picture of some of the site visits. Um, this is a portion going farther up to Revere. We did the guided kayak tour that Alice came to. It was fun. It was really, really fun. Um, our feet got totally stuck in the mud flats. It was uh, honestly uh, a really, uh, it was very challenging, but it was really nice to sort of come together with a group of people and really kayak down Chelsea Creek and, and land on the site as if we were like explorers. Uh, very fun event. Um, you know, a lot of local folks participated who had never been down the creek or even paddled before down the creek. Um, we did an existing con conditions analysis to understand the ecological fabric. Um, and as you know, you know, East Boston is quite a complex urban environment. Um, some of you may know this already, but uh, you know, obviously the way that the five islands of East Boston were, were, were formed were, was through the glacial melt of the Laurentide, the last ice age, essentially, right? The, la the last ice um, glacial melt was 25,000 years ago, the Laurentide ice. Um, and it created these series of drumlins uh, that essentially, you know, it was the Boston Harbor Islands, Beacon Hill used to be one of them. Fortunately, um, that was, you know, uh, it torn down. But uh, Orient Heights is the one drumlin that's still there. It's really amazing to know that we still have Orient Heights and it's still a drumlin. Um, but you can see here the natural formations uh, that were created through the you know, glacial ice melt. And this is the till that was left behind. And you can see here where the water used to flow from, from the creek straight into the broad sound. Um, and it's really important to understand that. Um, and I'll show you why later on. But again, these are the drumlins in purple. This one is still there. This is Orient Heights. Um, here's Chelsea. And this would be Eagle Hill. Um, what else? Yeah, this just sort of the glacial formations. You know, and as, uh, you know, Boston became more settled, you know, there was a changing landscape. You probably most of you know the history of Boston and Beacon Hill and sort of the development of Boston as a port, really important port. Uh, but by the end of the 17th century, most of those islands were, uh, you know, inhabited and cultivated, deforested. And obviously, well, at this point, there still wasn't, they weren't filled in. Um, but I'll show you sort of some of the history that is something important to note is the Battle of Chelsea Creek. Um, East Boston played a really important role in the American Revolutionary War. War. Um, you know, it, the Battle of Chelsea Creek was fought on the shores where we kayak to. Uh, really fascinating to understand that the second naval engagement of the American Revolutionary War was really a turning point for um, the U.S. independence from the crown, essentially. And this is the project area is part of that history. So it's really fascinating to see. Just another slide of uh, a presentation that was given last week, put out by the East Boston Library on the Battle of Chelsea Creek. Um, and again, uh, you know, at this point around 1880, uh, there was a huge development of, of urban rail expansion. And this project area, area is really crucial to the, to the development of Boston. Has such an important role to play the economic um, 
history of Boston essentially because the railways would would uh, they would they would ship uh, the goods you know across the harbor um, and then they would uh, offload them in the Jeffreys Point shipyards and then the railways that were built basically brought the goods up north you can see here um, the goods you know it's separated into the Grand Junction Railroad in yellow where it's the dotted yellow line and then the East Boston branch went straight up north which is the old abandoned railway site of the study area is essentially the East Boston branch that went up north. Um, and it, here you could see where the railway connected around where the Chelsea Street Bridge is. It went west as the Grand Junction or it went north as the East Boston branch. And you can also see where the Greenway is now was the Boston Revere Beach and Lynn Railroad, um, which is now obviously the Greenway. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we all know this, the Donald McKay shipyards uh, had an incredible history of clipper ship building. So East Boston was the center of clipper ship building at the heart of the harbor. Um, it was a very strategic location. It doesn't show it in this presentation, but, you know, many of you might know that uh, Samuel Maverick was the first settler of, you know, the, the East Boston Islands um, in 16th. 33. Um, and then later on in 1836, I think it was 1836, uh, William Sumner uh, started the East Boston Trade Company. And, and that kind of set in motion the way that the, the street layout was created and designed um, for East Boston, um, as well as some of the, you know, the set in motion, sort of the development of East Boston and it being sort of a hub to the north shipping goods and people from Boston through East Boston up north. Um, obviously, you know, it, this is an, a really interesting ad where they were trying to lure people to buy property up at the hill in Orient Heights, um, which is really interesting to know. Uh, and then you can see here in blue, you know, as sort of urban expansion happened, that's when land uses started to change, start to modify the edges. So here we, in blue, we see the, the Crooked Creek where, you, where it used to flow from the Chelsea Creek through what is now the Harborview neighborhood, essentially, through to the Belle Isle Marsh and out into the Broad Sound. So the water essentially used to flow from the creek to the, to the harbor. And as you know, the railway uh, helped expand you know, the economy of Boston, shipping goods up north, obviously they started to fill in all of these areas. Um, unfortunately, you know, a, an important piece as they started to, it was three waves of landfilling in 1925, as the airport started to, you know, be built, uh, you know, they took Wood Island Park. Well, this was later in the 1960s, but Wood Island Park was a, a, a green space that was created by Frederick Law Olmsted. Probably some of you might know, it was an incredible resource for the community you know, acres of land. It was like a vacation spot essentially for the working class neighborhood of East Boston and other people. Um, and and uh, unfortunately that was taken over by Massport by eminent domain in the 1960s um, as sort of the expansion of East Boston was happening. Um, but in 1920, you can see here is an aerial view. You can see here the Drumlin, Orient Heights. To the right is Eagle Hill. Here's an old pump station that's still there and the railway corridor going right up north. And if you look, these were farmlands. So as they started to fill in this area, first it was farmlands, uh, but you can still see the water flowing. If you see here, the water was still flowing all through, all the way, that's Crooked Creek, all the way into the Broad Sound. This is in the 1920s. Then um, obviously, you know, the advent of public transportation had a lot of influence on the area. And here we start to see an acceleration of urban development in the late 20s and early 30s, where now they're filling in this area a lot more. Um, I believe at this point they had the Navy Fuel Depot where they had oil tanks in this site. Actually, to show you here. You see, you can see, yeah, still they, they right here where you see farmland. After that, they commissioned, um, the US government commissioned that site for uh, US Navy Fuel as a U.S. Navy Field Depot. 
Um, but again, this is how the land uses started to change. It became a very industrialized area. Um, clearly no open space over here. It was just being filled in, um, you know, basically stopping the flow of water from the creek to the broad sound. And this whole area became very industrialized um, in the 1930s. Here you can see it. Um, if you look in here where they started to fill in Crooked Creek, now it's completely filled in. And now you can see the expansion of the neighborhoods. Here you have Orion Heights. Here you have the Harborview neighborhood starting to be built the Eagle Hill neighborhood over here. Um, and you can still see here, this part of the airport is still not expanded, um, but in the 1930s, it just essentially begun. Um, but you can see the changes of the land use. This picture is a, is a good one. And here you can see Irving Oil Terminal site. Wasn't it, the tanks weren't even there yet. Neither were the jet fuel tanks. Well, actually, yes, yeah, some of them were right here. Um, again, land use changes very important to our study area to try and understand you know what happened in in history and what does that mean for the future now crooked creek is completely filled in you have the urban oil terminals to the north and here you have the jet fuel uh tank farm to the south again air, huge uh airport expansion in the 1950s and and that you know, sort of defined part of that industrial shoreline. You can see here uh, the expansion of the airport from the first to the third, how sort of it grew exponentially impacting the neighborhood. And in 1968, 69, as I said, uh, Massport took over Wood Island by eminent domain. They demolished a whole neighborhood on Neptune Road, um, basically, you know, removed a whole neighborhood to build an extension of the runway. It was a huge fight. Um, I don't know if you guys know the history of the Maverick Mothers and the fight against airport expansion in the 60s. I was able to capture that with a couple of activists and my brother who was a filmmaker. And we have a whole documentary in that. If you wanna look at that, it's called Destinations Boston. Um, but again, now in the 1970s, we're talking about you know a decline uh, of the land uses you know for maritime uses um, along the site. So you can see here in purple, these are still used for industrial purposes. You know, still in, it's still port uses. Um, Crooked Creek is no longer there. Uh, no open space around the project area whatsoever. And now you have a declining industrial uh, use and you have now all the surplus land. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of the, you know, the expansion of the railway and the maritime industry and, and other industries, what it did was it, it took away a lot, of, um, a, lot, a lot of the edges for public use. Um, here you can see Wood Island mudflats, they still exist, thank God. Here's the Bella Mar Reservation, Bella Marsh, which is the last remaining salt marsh. On the bottom, you can see that picture that I showed you earlier, which is facing south of the study area uh, at low tide. And then to the right, you can see the Condor Street Urban Wild, which is a good example of an urban park that was done through land reclamation. You know, again, we did a study, you know, through, we did an ecological and, uh, you know, habitat study. And we were able to define that this area is really critical um, for certain estuarine residents, um, you know, striped bass, winter flounder, um, you know, obviously the Isle of Wife herring through the Mystic River and the Chelsea Creek is part of the Mystic. Um, so we can fairly surmise that, you know, there are some good, you know, some species that are thriving in the area, um, blue mussels and so forth, uh, other sort of shellfish of significance. The green crab is an invasive species. Um, this is just sort of, you know, um, the yellow wife and, and blueback herring migration that is done by the Mystic River Watershed Association. Again, it's a regional flyway for a lot of migratory bird species. So again, significance, right? Ha significant habitat for some of the shorebirds um, and including some that are endangered. Um, so we're trying to capture that in the vision, trying to understand, you know, what could we do with this site where we're able to ecologically restore the site, create some habitat for some of the existing species, but at the same time, balance those industrial and community needs um, and create an open accessible waterfront space. Um, this is just, I'm not sure why that slide is in there, but 
snowy owl and the coyotes. Um, but again, landscape lost and made. You know, that's what we that's what we really wanted to understand as part of the visioning project and sort of work with the local stakeholders to utilize this expertise and sort of share that knowledge with them so that everyone can really understand as we're looking towards the future, you know, where can we capture all these opportunities to create, you know, this essentially to try and reclaim some of that land, ecological restoration, create some open spaces um, and, and whatever the community desires, but also work with the support stakeholders and the industries near the site to try and figure out how do we sort of come to a compromise. Um, you know, you can see here, again, just saying Crooked Creek was filled in in the 1930s. Uh, Constitution Beach was built in the 1950s as sort of a make good for having taken Wood Island. Sales Creek was filled in. There's a culvert there that's not flowing anymore. Um, and you know, earlier than that, you have the railway expansion, which I just explained. This sort of puts everything into context. Um, again, industrial nature of the site. We're dealing with designated port areas, so there is a limitation to the uses. Um, this site does not have, however, um, direct. Um, it doesn't have deep water access, there, there is no water dependent industries, it's just a designated port area with a limited maritime use. Um, we really needed to understand what that meant in order to try and sort of envision what we can actually do on that site. And it is a bit of a complex regulatory framework along the whole site, starting at the pump station all the way to the north. Um, but you can see here outlined in the yellow uh, dotted lines is where the designated port area. So this is all DPA. And by the way, um, there currently is a DPA boundary review happening for both East Boston and now the Chelsea Creek. So everything's sort of happening real, happening real time. Um, and this was, you know, an industrial employment center. Um, you know, I see a lot of heavy industry, um, commercial industrial, you can see sort of the the mosaic of colors there with the legend industry, heavy commercial, commercial, um, manufacturing, transportation, warehouse, um, and other wholesale. Again, you know, we're dealing with a legacy industrial shoreline, very degraded, unfortunately. Um, but it is still an urban water body it's connected to the harbor right at the confluence right here where the harbor meets the Mystic River and it is part of the Mystic River. And then over here is the island end in Mill Creek. Um, so here you can see to the left what I was talking about earlier, the Navy fuel depot that was then decommissioned. And that's the, you know, where actually Cargo Ventures is now. And more closer to the shoreline is the railway that we're studying. And here you can see Route 1A is starting to sort of be developed. Um, and to the right, you can see what it looks like now. And again, a mosaic of land uses. And I know this sounds like a really busy slide, but um, it's good to sort of put it into colors and you can see along the project area, it's mostly commercial industrial. And here is a whole neighborhood over here. Um, yeah, and here in yellow, you can see sort of the residential pockets. We have Harborview, Orion Heights, and Eagle Hill. Those are the three adjacent neighborhoods to the site. And um, again, you know, East Boston, as most of you know, is heavily immigrant neighborhood. It's an environmental justice community as designated by the Commonwealth under Executive Order 552. Um, so, you know, it is behind the eight ball. These are EJ communities that have a lack of you know, access to open space and the waterfront. This is Orion Heights. And this is Harbor View right here. It's the closest to the site. And then here you have Eagle Hill. These are all pictures of our programming. Um, you know, neighborhoods shaped by immigration, historically diverse and global community. You know, the Irish came in the you know, early 1830s to the 1900s and the Eastern Europeans. Um, we had obviously a big wave of Italians after World War II. Then we had the, you know, the Latin American and Central Americans, Southeast Asians in the 70s. And then more recently we've had um, you know, North African people as well. You know, very global community. Uh, more than 40% of the population in Orient Heights 
Harbour View and Eagle Hill is Latino with a total Latino population of the area being 59%. You can see that in blue, the light blue up here and the yellow and closer to Orient Heights, you have more of a, you know, a, a Caucasian population, but still it's mixed, very mixed. Um, multilingual community, 42% of the total population in the area was born in Latin America. Um, the largest foreign born population is Salvadorian as most of you know, and Colombian. And you can see the percentages there along the site, 22.8%, 34.4% and 49.1%. A very working class community. Um, but, you know, look at the median, uh, well, the 23% of the population is 25 and above, um, has a bachelor's degree or higher. But look at the, the, the comparison with Boston. It's 51.4% across the state is 44.5% and the US 32.6%. So 31% of the population over 25 doesn't have a high school diploma, which is higher than the city average, which is 13.1 and high, much higher than the state average, which is 9.3. Um, working class community, 20% of the population works in the industries of construction and maintenance, production, transportation, natural resources. Um, and I'm just kind of flying through these because I know that we got to finish up, but the median household income of neighborhoods in the area range from 42,000 to 58,000 more or less, which is significantly less than the city, state and national medians. And you can see it right here. So we're dealing with you know, trying to envision something along a site with an, you know, next to an, an environmental justice population, but really with a lower median household income than the city, state, and, and nationwide averages. And that's something that we really need to consider as we're thinking about what to, what to do with the site. Um, again, a community relying on public transit, and you can see where the blue circles, those are the, those are the T stops, the blue line T stops you have, Maverick, Airport, Wood Island, Orient Heights, Suffolk Downs and so forth going up. Um, and across you have the commuter rail, the Chelsea, going to Chelsea. But look at this whole area where we're visioning. There's no access to public transportation. Um, so that's something that we really want to notate and make sure that whatever is developed there has that in mind to make sure that people in that neighborhood can get better access to transportation. Um, again, you know, the stats for along Route 1 area are really horrific. I mean, honestly, there's been too many fatalities, especially recently. It is not safe to cross Route 1A. There's no access to the waterfront. Um, so, you know, this is really an opportunity. This is, we can make good through this visioning if we can get to an implementation stage. We can create a safer, more accessible shoreline area with potentially a pathway um, that serves mul you know, multiple purposes, but it really creates a safer space for, for people. And again, environmental justice community um, that has a need for open space. And if you look at the stats right here, open space per habitant, um, for ha you know, yeah, per habitant is downtown Boston is 10.5, which obviously that's downtown, that's a financial district, East Boston is 17.55 per person. Somerville, Cambridge is 26.76. Winthrop is higher. Chelsea is higher. Um, and the World Health Organization recommends that it should be 96 square foot per person. Obviously, we're way behind those, those uh, aspirational numbers. Um, again, open space. The nearest thing would be the Belle Isle Marsh or the Constitution Beach and the Greenway. There is virtually no open space anywhere near the site. Um, and, and that's a problem for the neighborhood that lives there. So we could potentially be creating, you know, not just access to the waterfront, but really open space that would foster a social resiliency um, and really make good on some of the sort of environmental injustices from the past. And this is um, just a slide that where we did a study about access to food um, the New England Produce Center is right across the water. Um, but, you know, you don't have uh, essentially no, no supermarket nearby for any of the people that live around here. You have um, stop, and, stop and shop uh, and Target by Suffolk Downs, but that's technically Revere. 
And then Shaw's is all the way over here by Central Square. So again, access to food is a big issue as well. Impacts of Logan, noise pollution. You can see the contours here. Um, this site is not as affected as some of the um, neighborhoods closer to the airport, but still it, it does have some noise pollution. And you know, talking about asthma rates among adults 18 plus, percentage of people without health insurance. Uh, we looked at all of these sort of stats to try and understand what's happening in the neighborhood. Um, obesity rates among adults 18 plus um, in the project areas, for example, it's 26.8 to 30%. Asthma rates are 10.6 to 11%, and people without health insurance was 8.3%. And obviously a very impacted community by COVID. We saw the numbers um, throughout the year, how East Boston was one, one of the neighborhoods most affected by COVID. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is some good social infrastructure um, throughout East Boston. We have a lot of community centers, a lot of schools. We have um, nearby, you have the Bradley School, the Madonna Queen of the Universe, um, you know, the Curtis Guile, the East Boston YMCA, the Marty Pino Community Center. So, you know, you do have a, a pretty robust social infrastructure, not necessarily along the site, but, but around the Orient Heights area and Eagle Hill and Harborview as well. So you wanna be able to sort of close the loop by creating something on the side of the Chelsea Creek that will, you know, create an even more robust social infrastructure. This is just um, an engaged community, some of the programs that we've done and some of the organizations that we partner with, Climate Nature Program, Green Roads, Easty Farm, Pierce Park Sailing. And we, did, we didn't do a thorough flood analysis or um, climate impact analysis, but we did you know, look at the Climate Ready Boston um, reports and, and really try to understand what was happening in the area. Um, Urban heat island is a big issue in East Boston. Um, yeah, increased rainfall along Route 1A is very problematic. There's been instances where, you know, intense rainfall in a given day was literally flooding Route 1A where you couldn't traverse. Um, you know, urban tree canopy is an issue as well along the site. There is just not enough urban tree canopy along the site or in, in the you know, nearby neighborhoods. Um, and we were looking at the annual mean sea level rise from 1960 up until now. So we wanna make sure that we incorporate all of this into anything that could potentially be built there. Uh, because Crooked Creek is to flow from the creek to the broad sound, the water is trying to sort of reclaim its space again. And you can see um, you know, some of the projections uh, from flooding from the Climate Ready Boston report um, for, I think this is 1% annual chance flood in the dark blue right here. And, you know, clearly the, the water, you know, will, will try to reclaim some of its space back. So we need to build, you know, we need to use this opportunity to build a more resilient sort of edge um, if, if we can. And here is, Flooding and sea level rise 2070. These are again the projections from Clara and Boston. So you can see here in, in the lighter blue and in the darker blue. The darker the you know, the darker the blue, you know, the higher. Uh, yeah, open space opportunities. Again, you can see here by just looking at the colors. Here's open space Bella Marsh, Constitution Beach, Greenway, and a couple of small pocket parks. Urban Wild is over here. Nothing over here. We, you know, we did this analysis and we, we noticed that there was really a lack of open space along the site. Um, so we could potentially be creating some open space if we can get to an implementation stage. And then we created a framework plan for a more resilient and equitable. Uh, let me know how much time I have, Alice, but essentially the vision came up with four concepts, a network of greenways. It's about resilient. five minutes. But okay. if you want to squeeze it on, we've only got one question so far. People who are tuning in, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Sure. A resilient edge, an urban boulevard, and a working waterfront. Uh, based on the feedback and the workshops um, and everything we, in the, the existing conditions analysis, um, we were able to sort of come up with four of these concepts, which we still sort of 
narrowed down in terms of phase two, um, but potentially we can create floodable landscapes, waterfront access, access view corridors. We can be supporting local economy, again, ecological restoration, promoting open space, traffic calming along Route 1A, creating neighborhood connections, and created, creating more social resilience. A network of greenways, which is part of the whole East Boston Greenway expansion loop. Uh, we can really close the loop by creating open space in this project area. Um, again, need for open space. We have underutilized infrastructure right now. We have the Marty Coughlin bypass road that is currently unused, and that's an opportunity. Um, existing conditions we talked about. And again, creating the East Boston Loop, establishing neighborhood connections, connecting to Marine Heights. Now it's not really revealing Crooked Creek, but creating more green infrastructure along where Crooked Creek used to be and promoting social resilience. And this is just sort of a rendering. If you're looking from the Chelsea Street Bridge facing north, this is the old pump station, which is owned by cargo, but we could potentially have some mixed uses uh, in that structure maybe create um, a you know, sort of floating dock, you know, create more educational opportunities for the community and so forth. And again, this is a picture of flooded Route 1A that I took in one of the intense rainfall events. This is what happens along Route 1A, along the site. Um, and again, ecological restoration. Uh, future conditions, we looked at the, you know, the flood impacts and we could be creating a more resilient edge if we can get to an implementation stage. So again, we want to mitigate the flood risks, um, create floodable landscapes and public open spaces, provide water access, build social resilience and foster stewardship and enhance the ecology of the creek. And this is just sort of the rendering that we came up with to try and incorporate you know, an acknowledgement that there is industry there, but creating open space and a more resilient edge. Yep, and the, and the urban boulevard concept is really to try and mitigate some of the hazardous conditions along Route 1A. I mean, a very high traffic, congested highway. There's been way too many accidents and we wanna sort of leverage this opportunity to continue to envision how we can use this study area to really enhance um, you know, the Route 1A corridor, make it safer essentially to cross. This the existing pedestrian walkways is a hazard. People have died crossing there. I would never cross that. Um, and obviously, yeah, existing conditions, I think we've seen. We have a, a stats with a lot of accidents. Um, we wanna promote traffic calming along Route 1A, enhance neighborhood connectivity and create an urban edge in these particular crossover points. These were very well studied um, especially with util design, trying to understand where we can actually create connections. And this is what it could look like. I love this rendering. Um, this is uh, Addison Street, uh, that, that hazardous uh, crossover that I just showed you in the other picture. This is what we could potentially be creating. A lot of tree canopy, you know, a greenway along the shoreline. People would have the opportunity to cross safely and we can create a connection to the waterfront uh, restore some marshes, you know, potentially create a bus stop, have some educational opportunities along the shoreline, use this space over here. Obviously it's owned by cargo, but we could potentially negotiate some civic space use, have a dock, etc., And then a working waterfront. And I think I'm pretty much done. Um, yeah, existing conditions, we talked about that. Uh, this is more the concept of the wor working waterfronts to see if we could potentially, you know, create more jobs for local residents. Um, so work more closely with the existing industrial commercial businesses in and around the site to try and foster more economic opportunities for local folk. So support local economic development, create access and view corridors and prior prioritize public access along the creek. And this is just the final slide. This is kind of a cross section of what this could look like. Um, you can have flood barriers, vegetated buffers, um, you know, bioswells. You can have open space. You know, you can have different kinds of pathways along the site. 
Um, obviously you can do things like rip wrap or different edge um, designs where you can be restoring some habitat to, you know, or create some habitat for some of the existing species. And yeah, what else? Mud flats, high marsh, open space, a greenway, vegetative buffers, bioswells, and then here is where the property ends with the private property. I think that's it. Yeah, sorry, I kind of breezed through it at the, at the end, Alice. That's totally great. I think we can, um, I'm going to say that some of what you've shown here, we can keep the slides up and you can go back okay. as you answer the questions. Mm -hmm. um, Karen says, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, there's a question about whether or not this can do something where it would connect Crooked Creek and Chelsea Creek and Broad Sound. Um, I don't know if that's so much your site or that you're hoping to work with you know, you've shown a great crossing from this world into Suffolk Downs, and then from Suffolk Downs, you can go um, yeah, over it's, to Belle Isle Marsh. That, there's like many things I think that would make yeah. it happen. So it's really, it's a great question. We analyzed this like thoroughly, you know, we would, I would love to daylight Sales Creek and Crooked Creek, but it's not possible. It's filled in. The water can, you know, cannot, you know, that's just not gonna happen because there's a neighborhood there where Crooked Creek was. And it goes all the way, the neighborhood is now built all the way to the other side. But what we could do is potentially start this trend of restoring some of the marshes along the site that we're studying and create kind of like some green infrastructure where Crooked Creek used to be, which is along Boardman Street. So we can start to sort of leverage opportunities to start to design more green infrastructure along, but we, you know, we currently, we, we can't they like Crooked Creek, unfortunately. I would love to, but it's not a feasible option because there, there are homes, there are residential developments, there are businesses there, it's filled in. Um, but in a, in a perfect world, we'd be able to allow the water to flow from Chelsea Creek to the Broad Sound. But the best we can do is probably just, you know, create a pathway to kind of, when we say reveal Crooked Creek, we're not gonna reveal it, but we're going, we, we, we would like to acknowledge that there was water there. So, you know, but clearly that's outside of our study area. This is just sort of looking, zooming out. Sort of to pay homage to, to that work. To acknowledge that the water- that history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a great answer. I think the next question from Frank, he says, first of all, this has been a really wonderful, positive work of a community-based planning. I would agree. I think this is, this is exactly, you know, people talk about community-based planning. This is it, you're, you're doing it. Um, and Frank wonders how you can talk, if you can talk a bit more about how this might be applicable to the Boston Environment Department, the Climate Ready East Boston, are these tied into that work? Are these informing that work? Yeah, great question. And we were very strategic and we had very thorough conversations with the Environment Department to make sure that we're aligning our processes. Um, we wanna work together in collaboration with all of our city and state partners but push the envelope a little bit. So our goal was like, yes, of course, we wanna align our planning processes, but we are not pretending to do what they're doing because what they're doing is a really deep dive into the flooding analysis um, of the, flood, this, the flooding and climate impacts of Orient Heights. Whereas what we're doing is we looked at some of those stats in, in our existing conditions analysis, but we're, we were doing more like you know, opportunities for resilient edge and access and resilience in general, which included social resilience. So there's a difference, but we also had to shift our timeline to accommodate Climate Ready Boston Phase Two because we want to make sure that whatever comes out of that study is incorporated into our next phase of our vision. Um, so we're working, you know, I would say relatively closely with our city partners to make sure that nothing is missed so that we align our planning processes and visioning. I will note that next Thursday is the next Climate Ready East Boston Open House, and I am putting the very, oh, it doesn't Great. need to be that long. Thank you, that's awesome. I'm putting the link in the chat so people can hopefully. Perfect. I wanna make sure that link isn't broken. I feel like I try to clean links and then they, they don't work. So that, the link is in the chat if people wanna get involved in that. Um, Steve asks a photo question. The 1925 aerial view you showed includes a Zeppelin, and he wants to know if you think it might be the Hindenburg or just I, a Zeppelin. Um, good eye, good eye, because a lot of people very did not question. notice. 
Yes, a lot of people do not notice. Let me see if I can go back. I know we have so many slides. Um, I don't think it is, you know, we actually talked about that with the Scape Design Studio folks, you know, the team, and we're like, I don't think it is. I think it was probably another one. I mean, where's that slide? You almost can't see it. I'm surprised he even noticed it because a lot of people just don't notice that it's there. Um, there, I missed it, there. Okay, you're talking about this one, right, Steve? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, it says U.S. Navy. If you see there, it says U.S. Navy. Can you see it? So I don't. Think I will trust you. Yeah, it says U.S. Navy. So I don't think it is, but I guess there's other. Uh, oh, Steve. Steve thinks yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks, Steve, for that. Um, that would be amazing. I mean, this is an amazing picture, to be honest with you. Yeah. So good eye, Steve. Thank you. Um, Susan has two questions. Um, one, first of all, she says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, she wants to know, first of all, if there are any plans for the Chelsea Revere parts of the Creek and also what are some next steps to make this dream come true? Great questions. Um, so you're saying like on the Chelsea side, I'm assuming that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our, our study is really done along the East Boston side. Um, but you know, I know that Green Roots also does visioning on the Chelsea side as well. And, you know, they have their, you know, their initiatives. Um, so, you know, we're really trying to incorporate what's happening sort of in the whole area within the context of the whole area, because obviously we share the creek, right? Two communities, Chelsea, East Boston, share the creek and we're so tied together. People live in Chelsea, work in East Boston, work in Chelsea, live in East Boston, and then crossing over the, the water is, you know, really part of normal life. Um, I'm not sure what they're planning on the Chelsea side, but obviously we want to leverage anything that's happening so we can link it up together. And so people can essentially potentially walk over the bridge and then walk over the pathway along Chelsea as well. Um, and then the second question was, how can we help make this dream come true? Yeah. So right now we're focused on getting a cohort of funders, even though this was this phase one is fully funded by cargo. We don't think that's the best way forward because we want create, we want to create consensus. So we want, we want to diversify the funding. We want sort of a cohort of funders, which what we're working on right now. And we want to narrow down the scope of work for phase two. We are at this point thinking that most likely, almost surely we'll have a phase two. So make sure that you sign up with our email newsletters and stay in touch because we're going to do a phase two and we're going to take this to another level. The goal is to really push this, to get this to a point where we can actually build something somewhere in the near future in the next few years. So I'm not leaving this on the shelf. I'm personally committed to this you know, vision and this project to make it come true. And I think a lot of people who were engaged in this process are doing the same. This is not something that's gonna like where the designers and the team, they come, they present, nice vision, wonderful, aspirational, we leave. No, we are local, we live here. We're gonna try to make sure that this vision comes true. Um, so stay tuned and there will be a phase two, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Awesome. Thank you, Magdalena. We are just about at eight o'clock. I am putting in the chat a link to Green Roots, which is a nonprofit that works on the other side. Well, they work in East Boston as well, but they're also on the other side of Chelsea Creek. Uh, maybe we can have them back to talk about some of their work or learn more. I know that they are doing some work, particularly north of the Chelsea Street Bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they are. The island along. and river and Mill Creek, definitely. Yep. And um, and if you're also a Chelsea nerd, you can note that they um, had a recent public meeting about their municipal harbor plan. So there's also some, some really great um, visions and goals in that plan if people wanna nerd out about the other side of, of the creek. Um, on behalf of Boston Harbor Now, and most especially the friends of the Boston Harbor Walk, we want to give a super big round of applause to Magdalena, who I Thank failed you. to note at the beginning, is the both the, one of the founders and the executive director of Harbor Keepers. Um, they're a nonprofit based in East Boston. They are residents of East Boston. So when Magdalena talks about living and working in her community, it's exactly what she's talking about. We're really grateful to have her here. And I'm really grateful um, for all of you who joined for continuing to support the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk and all of their great work doing tours, developing signs and keeping the Harbor Walk clean. Um, I have failed to pull up the link, but I should note that if you are on Instagram, the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk have a great Instagram account that you should go find, Boston Harbor Walk. Um, look it up and be sure to follow that account. Magdalena, yes. thank you so much. Thank and you. everyone, Liz, have a, a great night. Sorry, I had to fly through that presentation. A lot of information, but we have the project website. I don't know if we put it in the chat box. Oh. Um, 
we can do that. Um, you want to do it or you want? Um, you can, you can, everything is in the website, harborkeepers.org, Vision Chelsea Creek. Oh, here we go. I have it. Yep, Vision Chelsea okay. Creek, link in the chat. So yep, you can. That's it. Get yeah. Back. And, you know, reach out if, for any further questions. Make sure you sign up so that you get the announcements for phase two when that kicks off. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I love the work of the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk. Love to partner with them. They're amazing. Thank you, Liz. And Mike, I know, I don't know if he's here, but Mike is also yeah. uh, awesome. So thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you.